You're listening to Coach Mike on the Mic. Let's Talk Hoops. A podcast that brings hoop fans together and their stories to life. Coach Michael Herrera is a Texas high school basketball coach with three state Final Four appearances and a lifelong fan of the game. He'll sit down with coaches, players, and fans to share stories, game perspectives, X's and O's, and lessons learned along the way. Now, let's talk hoops. bit and do something what um what i call halftime um favorite moment we're going to try to go rapid fire here so just kind of okay. maybe a, like in a sentence or so um favorite moment at tu probably um beating cincinnati in the sweet 16 game there was a lot of hoopla about it um You know, they were number two seed, but they would have been number one if their big kid wouldn't have broke his leg. Yeah, Kenyon Martin. Yeah, they still had four or five All-Americans on the team. I mean, they were – they were – they they didn't think we were um, justified in playing them, and they said stuff um, to, to embarrass Eric. Uh, he was a black cowboy. Um, as you know, he was just unbelievable competitor and strong. And, and could fly um, out the gym. <laughs> he could, yeah, he could fly. He could, he could do it all. But they kind of embarrassed him. And he had a phenomenal game. But the way I remember it, at the end of the, the, the in the second half, we, uh, th- th- we went about eight minutes or nine minutes without a timeout. He, he, he had called, um, the coach from, uh, Cincinnati had, um, um, called the time immediately let his team go out there. They started to run the play and he called another timeout to, uh, they were screwing it up. So, we had about nine minutes there where we didn't – he had like one timeout left. And it it changed the game because our kids were in great shape and his guys were were gassed. And, and our guys could tell it. Greg, uh, Dante, um, Marcus, all of them could tell that they were fatigued and for – whatever reason the the clock doesn't stop and it it was the most amazing time for me as a coach to sit there and watch my team or our team play with that kind of intensity and fatigue because they were tired too but we we went for the juggler and end up beating them and it was probably one of the most satisfying wins that I've ever been a part of. I think that was a pivotal moment too in that uh, in that ride to the Elite Eight. You know, playing against Miami and Cincinnati, and playing against North Carolina and Austin. But uh, you kind of surprised me there, man. I thought you were going to go the the win against Dwayne Wade and uh, Marquette. But uh... well, <laughs> uh, I I think the Marquette win no doubt is my personal game that I really uh, love the fact that Greg and Antonio and, and Dante and, and Jason and Kevin and Charles, Charlie Davis, we played really, really well together. And um, they, they played so good. I think we shot like 60% from three uh, for most of the game. And, I'll, I'll never forget looking down at the other end. And um, I believe that Dwayne Wade is one of the best players I've ever coached against. 
but they had a point guard that thought he was good and he was good, but he thought he was better than Dwayne at the end of the game. And he really um, cost him the ball game because Dwayne was open, but he shot it anyway. And um, we didn't have anybody tall enough to guard him. Uh, Dante would, did a great job on him, but it, it, um, we had the smallest lineup, I think, in Division One. I, 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 I would have to say that we were probably one of the smallest, but man, one of the fastest. Yeah, we were fast. <laughs> well, I tell you I what, I'll you. never, I'll never forget the look on your face after that win. You know, I think TU will always remember your face walking across the floor after that win. Well, I've got that picture somewhere, and my wife shows it to me every time. Hey, well, if you have a if you have a digital copy, you'll have to send that to me, and I can put it in this uh, in this podcast. But I coach, will, I will. Man to man or zone? Well, man to man. Okay. Um, give me one word that describes the following people: Kevin Johnson. Very. Um, very steady. He he could go down the floor five or six times in a row and hit that little jump hook, and you would go. He might not miss the rest of the night. I mean, he he was just so steady. Um, we could count on him. Um, whenever we played bad, it wasn't very often. Um, his junior senior year wasn't very often, but whenever we played bad, he didn't have a good game. And whenever he played good, even when Bill was there, he was really good. I mean, I'll tell you just, what, there were uh, there were qualities steady. about him that kind of reminded me of, or reminds me of Tim Duncan. With Ke- you know, Kevin was always such a quiet, kind-hearted person. Uh, you just had that that quiet leadership about him. How about uh, Greg Harrington? Well, I love Greg. He may be one of the fa- my favorite kids I've ever coached. Um, he had different speeds. He was the first guard that I had ever coached that I never asked him, but whether he knew to play at different speeds, um, cause he didn't look that quick and he didn't, he wouldn't out quick anyone the first 30 minutes of the game. But at the end of the game, he was always shooting that little, that little uh, teardrop. Little floater. Yep. And it was because he was getting by his guy. And before anybody, uh, he hadn't done it the whole game. I mean, it, you know, he scored uh, normally, but he was really adept at, at, um, going at different speeds. And I learned a lot from, from coaching Greg that um, you don't want to look at a kid and just say he's slow or he's fast, you know, because Antonio could out, outrun anybody. But he showed him uh, – I used to tell Antonio he, he would show him this speed early, and, hell, they just backed up. I mean, it was uh, – it wasn't – it wasn't a surprise to them where Greg, he, he lull you to sleep and be by you in a heartbeat. It's a crazy time when you've got Antonio throwing alley-oops to Dante. Like, I mean, you got, you know, two guys probably under six foot, you know, but it was certainly a fun time. All right. Next one, Tony Hurd. Tough, tough. Um, we played in the NCAA tournament and I think it was Charlotte. And, I look out there and he, he had, I don't know how he caught an elbow and he is, uh, he's like a boxer. He's, he's knocked out and he's standing up. He just, he, uh, they wouldn't let him go back in now, but he gets the, his bell rung and he's knocked out. And finally he goes to one knee and, um, uh, we take him out. This is in the first half and, um, the first round game and um, I'll never forget he's there on, on the bench for about two or three minutes and uh, Bill asked me is he alright and I said I don't know 
And I, I said, all we can do is, is trust and ask him. And I said, Tony, can you go back in? He said, sure. <laughs> and he goes in and knocks down about three or four threes. I mean, it was, it, it was a, a matter of him. Um, I can't even count on my hands how many times I saw him tough it out where he would get the knocked out of him and he would never back down. He was just, he was tough as, as a boot. And, uh, and it's really funny because off the court, uh, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't ever think he's that way. He's very, very, um, congenial and very nice to everybody. And, and but you didn't want to mess with him on the court. He's Coach, you asked you asked earlier about, you know, my TU experience and have, having gone from, you know, being on the women's practice team my sophomore year to then being a walk on my junior year. I'll never forget one day. It was my sophomore year. Um, you know, obviously I knew probably Lila more than I knew Tony uh, just because I was on the practice squad with the women's team uh, with Coach Miller. But they invited me over over just to hang out for the afternoon. I'm like, I'm going to go hang out with Tony. I heard, and I know Tony's probably going to hopefully listen to this, but like for me, that was that connection piece. Like would that have normally happened on another campus? I don't know, but to, to attest to what you're saying, that's the kind of person Tony was. And I just, I felt welcomed, you know, I, I felt uh, validated as a friend, you know, so he definitely is that person. All right. Uh, can a r random question here, best vacation destination. If you're to choose one, where would you go? Hmm. Probably um, Europe, Switzerland. I spent a lot of time in Germany, and I would like to see kind of what it what it's like today. Uh, that was in the '60s, and it, it uh, I'm sure it changed immensely. But um, I would just like to travel around in in Europe and. I went to Spain and France and Switzerland and Amsterdam and all those places. I'd like to see, see them again. Okay. All right. And uh, you mentioned your wife a little while ago. Um, so I want to ask, this is a, the last question for halftime. Um, best piece of advice from your wife while you've been coaching all these years? Well, it's, um, I was telling somebody this the other day and I was I got my first head coaching job at Manford and Manford's a three A school. Um, I had been at TU and a graduate assistant and then got my master's and went on uh, to, to uh, become a uh, head coach at Manford. And the first three ball games that I ever coached, I averaged two technicals a game. And <laughs> And she, my wife w wasn't really a basketball fan. Um, she didn't, didn't know what she's getting into when she married me, but um, she um, said one day after the third, third game, I can't remember exactly. I can't remember this exactly the, the timeline, but it was about the third game. And she goes, you know, you don't look like you're having fun. And I go, well, I'm not. Those referees are terrible. <laughs> and she goes, well, if you want to stay in this game and, and enjoy the game, you need to quit watching those guys because they're going to make mistakes. I mean, she doesn't even know basketball, and she's telling me. And, and she was right. Uh, for From that Time on in 45 years, I probably have gotten, I may be an exaggeration of five or six technicals, but I've found that if I was watching them, I couldn't watch the players. I couldn't make adjustments. I couldn't do the things I wanted to do. Now, did some of them make me mad <laughs> over the course of time? <laughs> Uh, yeah, but it really helped me in my career to be able to ignore those guys and, and uh, go from, from 
a critical um, referee watcher to a player watcher. And I found it was just so much more fun. I, I really, uh, we ended up having a, a, a very good year that year, but it, it, uh, it wouldn't have happened if I'd have kept the same attitude I had. It, it just would not have happened. The whole, I, I probably would have gotten out of coaching because uh, if she hadn't given me that advice. You know, Coach, I, listening to you say that I like it because I'm, I'm hearing some parallels in our lives with, you know, Catholic school to public school. You know, the concept of being a walk-on and, and being told you're not going to be playing. Um, but my wife, the same thing, man. Um, you know, she was a college athlete. She played college volleyball at Texas Tech. So she's got that, you know, athletic athleticism about her in the sense of the game, but she doesn't really know basketball. And in my early coaching career, it's the competitiveness in me that I was fighting for that call, arguing with the official and occasionally getting teed up and whatnot. And, and just like your wife, uh, my wife, Courtney, had kind of the same conversation with me. And she's like, why, why do you yell so much? Why are you yelling at them? Um, and then you reflect on that and, and you, you really think about like what I say and what I do, is it really going to make the referee take his whistle back? <laughs> you know, is he going to change or is it really going to make it worse for me down the road? And uh, so, man, I can't tell you the last time I've gotten a technical foul. It's been, it's been years. And we've got this like running, running joke on our staff here uh, because the head coach has been teed up more than I have and, and he would never get teed up. So uh, we always joke around that he's the meaner one, but uh, anyway, so yeah, that, that's a, that's a definitely a good piece of advice. And, and having the, having the sense of, you know, for all coaches that may be listening to this, you know, early in my career, you know, fiery and, and vocal with the referees and, and you start watching other coaches. Um, and there's some coaches that I would, I would list off here in, in the local San Antonio area that I've kind of, you know, observed and watched while we're coaching against them or maybe in a tournament and the calmness that those coaches have, you know, even at times, and I know coach Popovich is crazy at times, but the to to remain calm for the most part is such a a valuable lesson for all coaches to understand um because again it goes back to there's more than the game of basketball and these players are going to emulate how we talk and what we do and our interactions with others and if we're just always constantly berating and yelling at the officials that gives them the sense well then I can do it too and then the player gets teed up but then as a coach now you're mad at the player and it's like, but coach, you just, ah, okay, the transparency is there. So um, definitely some life lessons that I've learned by watching other coaches like yourself have that sense of calmness about you um, during the game of basketball. But coach, I want to ask you a question about, um, so starting and building a program, um, you know, you had the opportunity to go into certain environments and, and take over as head coaches at the high school and the collegiate level. And, and, you know, with every head coach, you have your own unique personalities and those own things that, that you want to instill and create a culture that you like. Um, what advice would you have for coaches out there starting or building a program from scratch or taking over a program? Well, um, you, have to, you have to be yourself. You can't be um, – another coach you can't be uh, your personality has got to be your yours uh kids can see through um any phoniness that that you might might uh might try to pass off on them uh kids are really really smart when it comes to that and you have to be genuine and honest um to to start I say I'm a first year coach. If you uh, put in a rule, uh, whatever it might be, uh, I, I was very, I had very few rules because I didn't want, um, they can always turn things around and, and say, well, you didn't do it to this guy and you did it to this guy. And, and, um, Basically, I always said, don't do anything to embarrass the program. When I went into a program the first time, all but one was a down program. They didn't have a good program the year before the year before. And they didn't have very many good players coming back. 
so I, from, from that standpoint, I always felt like you've got to instill in them that they never give up, that, that they may think they're tired, but they're not. And you establish that in practice. You, um, you don't necessarily have to go a long time, but you got to go hard all the time. And I, I really felt like the first year or two in a program, you are establishing what it's going to be. And the, the seniors every year are going to tell the guys that ain't good enough. And that's not going to get it with coach. You're not going to get it with coach. You got to, you got to bring it every day. You can't have a day off. And I think that attitude, that, that thought process that they know what you expect all the time. When it's practice, you got to go hard. It might be one hour and a half. It might be two hours and a half, but it won't, it won't be any longer than that. But you got to, you got to go hard all the time. And it, that translates into the game. Uh, it really does. And it translates into life. You, uh, um, you're going to be expected to get up and go to work and you can't half step it. You got to, you got to work if you want to get better. And um, uh, I don't think I um, – I always wanted to be consistent and, and treat kids fairly. I didn't want um, a superstar to think he was going to get away with, you know, um, something because he's a superstar. It just – it doesn't work with me. Now, it might work with some people that they – they can treat the superstars different than the the regular players, but I couldn't do that. I had to, maybe it's because I played on a team that was, was balanced and very on any given night, one of us could be the leading scorer. It, it, it had to be that way for, for me to be happy. And uh, um, I used to tell them, if you want me to be happy, you will, you will always not do anything to embarrass your team, but more importantly, you won't do anything to embarrass yourself. You've got to come with it every day. And, you know, we all have bad days, but you don't have to accept it. You don't, you don't have to um, uh, believe that it's going to happen every other day or – once in a while, oh, it's not going to happen during the season. Right, um, right. You got to bring it. I like how you said that because it's the simplicity of just, you know, you don't want to embarrass your team and you don't want to embarrass yourself. Um, here at the school that I, that I coach at, we often say that our three rules are if it doesn't make you a better man or a better person or a better athlete, then it's a rule. And so we, we try to keep it the same. And that's kind of what you're talking about, right? Because then if you do those things, it's going to embarrass your team and it's going to embarrass yourself. So I like that. Um, so on that note is what, what's something that's non-negotiable that you did as a head coach every day in practice, meaning like every single day in practice, we're always going to do either this drill or this conditioning, or was there something that you did absolutely every single day in practice? Well, my first 10 years in coaching, I was a defensive coach. I, it, it's all about effort. And I felt like I could, I was young and energetic and, and um, I don't know why everybody says that uh, uh, um, coaches that were good offensive players become good defensive players, but I, I was one of those. I, I wanted to, my teams to play good defense. And I think uh, as I got older, I really spent, oh, I, I spent a lot of time in shell drill, you know, We'd run it every day, no matter what. And um, I think about ten or twelve years into coaching, I found out that that you you'd better be good at passing and and scoring, and spend a lot of time on um, shooting and passing the ball. Always complimentary of anybody that made an un, um, unselfish play that it establishes good habits. And I found that if you brag on the players enough for one particular thing, such as passing, 
then they all want to please you. I mean, I, I don't do it for them to please me, but they, uh, it's a pretty hard headed kid that's, that is, um, is not wanting to be pleased or would not want to please his coach. So I, I really would, um, you know, sometimes the guy that was the leading scorer on the team would feel like he was neglected because I was bragging about the guys that were passing. And I, I think I became a offensive coach. Um, and I, I think I didn't give as much emphasis to the defense as I did, but, uh, it all balances out. <laughs> I'm sure the attention was still there to the defense, but, you know, I like how you said that because, you know, what I always like to say is kids will always do what you emphasize. And, and I always try to tell my athletes, hey, guys, listen, I'm going to give you the secret to success to more playing time for me. And so I always talk about how if you mess up on one end of the court, but you play defense and you take a charge for me, I've got short-term memory. I'm going to forget everything that happened down there. But now by you taking a charge for me and for your team, you just got more minutes. Like you're going to get more minutes because of that action. And then obviously my bench, my bench, because we watch film. Every time we take a charge, the whole team has to stand up and applaud them. And if, if I catch you on film, not standing up and applauding your teammate, sacrificing himself by taking a charge, you and I are going to have fun the next day in practice. So now when we watch film sessions, it's funny to watch the guys pull each other up by the arms during a charge because, you know, kids, sometimes they get distracted and they're looking that way or whatever, and the kid doesn't stand up. They'll pull each other up now to stand up, or they'll be the first ones to call that guy out in film session. <laughs> coach, coach, look, he didn't, he didn't stand up. You got to run him. Uh, so kids will do what you emphasize. Um, family, I've got a couple more questions here before we wrap things up. I'm um, talking about family as a, at the, even at the high school level, um, obviously more so at the collegiate level, because you have to travel to games far outside of the state, but talk a little bit of how you manage time uh, with your family and what your, your family meant to you during your coaching career. Well, I, I wish I could and, say, and I say that I don't mean to interrupt you coach, but I'm saying that because I'm early in my career. I've been coaching for 15 years and I know it takes its toll on my family. I know it takes its toll on my wife. And I know if I'm dealing with that, I know that many people, hopefully that are listening to this podcast, can have some insight into the things that you did to manage your time with your family. Well, it's difficult. I'll be perfectly honest. When, when I was young and my kids were young, um, I, it, it was hard. I mean, I love my job and um, the probably in a business guy that goes to work eight to five that would love his job more than I did. And it was difficult not to bring it home with me and think about it and do all that stuff. But I, I like I have said um, many, many times, I have a great, great wife and a great coach's wife and a great coach's mother. I mean, she is a tremendous mother and both, both of my children, um, are, um, products of high school, college basketball. They, they went with me everywhere. I took them, uh, my wife would even before GPS, she would take the kids when they were in, um, like one and three, she would take them to a basketball game at some small town. And I, I told her this year, I don't know how you did it without GPS and <laughs> how you could find um, these gyms in the dark. And I mean, she, she was just totally supportive and it helps when they are, um, you know, it, it really puts the burden on you to, to do your best if your wife doesn't meet you halfway. I mean, um, she, she became where she loved uh, my teams and my players, and she used to hug them when they came out and make them cookies. And, and I mean, it, it didn't matter whether it was high school or college. She was, she was totally supportive. Uh, and I think that really helps 
them feel like they're part of it, that they're, they're not dad's a coach and he, that's his job and he, he's doing it and he doesn't want us there. Um, I remember my son and, and daughter coming to practice with me and, uh, my son, when he was about a year old, got hit upside the head with a basketball and, and started to cry. And then one of the players said, what are you doing? You, you can't cry. And he, 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 <laughs> he it, 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 it helps when they are supportive. Um, but, you got to you got to do everything you can do. It's not easy. Um, it you know when they become teenagers and they wonder why you want to spend more time with them or with the with your team than you do. You got to make that quality time work for you um, because they're not going to get quantity, but the quality hopefully. Um, you can set aside uh, a Sunday or some time where you can just spend and spend time separately with, with your ch- children where they feel like they've got you, got your attention. Um, I, I learned that lesson very early and that if, if I have both of them, neither one of them feel like they're being treated special, but I would, uh, come home from school and tell my daughter, come on, we're going to, uh, uh, get ice cream or we're going to, we're going to go to the park. And that meant something more to them than, than, uh, if we would go as a family even. Yeah, that's so true. And thank you for sharing that because it's, it's so important to, to manage that time when you do have the time. And, and just by hearing you say the quantity part versus quality, um, you know, that, that helps me uh, tremendously too to remember about, even though that time is short that I have with my son and my daughter and my wife, make sure it's quality. Um, you know, it's so easy with, with, with phones and iPads and computers and TVs, um, you know, to even though you're having time with them, you got to turn all that stuff off. So coach, I've got a, a two more questions for you. One of them uh, has to do with, with coach Sutton and uh, coach self. So can you give me one thing that, that you have learned from either one of those coaches? Well, Coach Sutton was um, – everybody knows him like Mr. Iba as a defensive coach. But people don't realize, or I, I came to realize, how he controlled the tempo. Um, he, he never let a game get away. And what I mean by that is if, um, if there is um, uh, an offense that you can run that I would suggest that you run it fast and run it slow and figure out when in the game that you got to do both. Um, I learned this from coach Sutton that whenever I raised my fist, the players knew that they better pass the ball five times. Well, did I want them to do that for, um, for, because they didn't have a shot the first time? No, I want some time off the clock and control the tempo and that's what Coach Sutton did better than any coach that I know of. Um, Bill just fa- is fantastic. He he is the only coach that I know, and I know some of the good ones, that has a terrific personality. He feels like when you're when you're in a room that he needs to know you, and and he'll never forget your name. I mean, he's the dad gummus. He, he has the greatest memory. He used to have phone, phone numbers memorized, but I don't think he can do that anymore with the, with having your contacts and in, in your phone, but he never forgets names, janitors, um, secretaries. He's, he's really, really good. He is good at X and O's. 
when I was at OSU, he has really a great basketball mind. He understands the ins and outs of offense and defense, and he's not afraid to change. Um, when, when he was at ORU, he used to tell me, hey, uh, we, we started switching. And I said, that's, that's not good. And, and he goes, why? I said, because you don't know who to blame. I mean, every kid will blame it on somebody else. And of course, switching has become very, very good since then. But it was true at the time. The the players would would uh, would would obviously think it was uh, somebody else's fault besides theirs. And he's not afraid to change when it comes to X and O's. He he isn't. Everybody talks about how he's a um, uh, fast break coach. <laughs> it's whatever the that player that he's recruiting wants, what dialogue he wants to hear. Because <laughs> and he can do either one. He can do anything. I mean, he he'll do what the players can do, and uh, he's very good at that. I'll tell you what, Coach, uh, I read a book. uh, I can't remember which book it was, but it was a book by Coach K. And people that always talk about how he would personally memorize the other team, the other team's roster, um, from the starting five to the last guy to the walk-ons. And so at the end of a game when he shakes hands, you know, he'll say, "Uh, good game, John, Good, good game, you know, Tim, or whatever the kid's name is. Man, I wish that was in my repertoire, man, because my short-term memory is awful. Uh-huh. Coach, you can, you can ask me at the end of a game what the score was. I can't tell you, but I can tell you if we won or if we lost and if it was by a lot or a little. <laughs> so, uh, Coach, we're going to wrap this, this up. We I've got one last gifts. question. What's that? We all have different gifts. That's right. Absolutely. Amen to that, man. Um, my last question for you is – and you've mentioned a lot of coaches' names here, and so maybe it can be someone different or maybe it can be someone that we've talked about today. But if there's one coach that you'd like to thank um, that may have had the biggest impact on your life, um, whether it was basketball, whether it was life, um, who would that coach be and why? Well, I really didn't know it until the end. I mean, I knew it. I knew he was one of the special ones, but I didn't know how important he was to my development and my uh, becoming who I am. But my high school coach, Joe Shoulders, is that person. Uh, I learned everything I've ever gotten on basketball from, I didn't invent anything, but he gave me the, uh, the key ingredients to being a successful coach. Um, you know, Bill, Roy Williams, all, all of them, uh, John Wooden, the, the Mr. Iba, they're, they're all very, very important. But my high school coach was the difference for me um, in my development. Well, I'll tell you, Coach, you know, I asked that question um, because, and, and I mean this sincerely, um, the significance that you have had on my life from an observation standpoint because when I was even in college and as a walk-on, and I, I just had this picture in my head before practice would start, you were typically out there leaning against a score table with your arms folded. And I just remember observing this because as a walk-on, as a player who wasn't recruited, as a guy who probably wasn't going to get a lot of practice time that day, I got my shots up and my, and my stuff before practice started. So I was one of the first guys out there just to get shots up on the floor and just – feel a part of the team and, and play basketball. And, and even at that early age of, I mean, golly, I was probably, you know, uh, 20 years old, right? I would always notice you with your arms folded and leaning against the scores table, but every player that came onto the court would stop to talk to you and hang out and just talk life. And, and, and these are things that I recognize then that I can hold on to now as a, as a coach. And so, Coach, I mean, I sincerely mean this. Thank you for everything that you have done for me. Although I had a very insignificant role on the team, you had a significant role in the way I look at life, the way I look at basketball, and the way I look at relationships. And this, this is definitely um, a treat for me to be able to sit down and talk with you about life, 
about basketball. And, and I always tell my athletes and I always tell my students that if you have the opportunity to thank the people that have molded you and impacted you, find those opportunities to do so. Um, so here I am. And I just wanted to once again say thank you, Coach, for sure. Well, Michael, when the pandemic is over, I hope to come down and visit you and Fred and, um, and we can spend some time together because uh, um, every one of my players that I've ever coached, uh, I really feel a connection. And I, I am glad that all of them would stop and talk to me because I, I distinctly do not remember everything that that ever happened so uh, i appreciate it very very much absolutely coach well thank you for being on this episode of coach mike on the mic and until we we see each other god bless and take care same michael all right thank you coach thank you for listening to coach mike on the mic let's talk hoops if you enjoyed this episode be sure you subscribe and click the notification button and then share it with your friends. If you're so inclined to do so, would you please rate and review this podcast so that I can help grow this community of listeners? I hope there was something that you heard today that entertained you or connected you to the game of basketball. If you'd like to be a guest or know someone who would be a great guest on the show, please comment below or reach out to me on any of my social media platforms. Until the next time we meet, the ball is now in your court. Be someone's champion today.